feature film. She chose to part participate in this year's TED conference because she wants to share something positive with people. Ava specifically chose her topic on the effect of pet animals on people because she's inspired by her own pets and wanted to continue to explore an area on a deeper level. Please welcome Ava Cafasso as she presents The Pet Effect. So, how many of you have pets? Uh, please raise your hand if you have a pet. All right, so, that's a lot of you. So, when you get home, you put your bag down, you have a snack, and then you see your animals. You pet them and hug them and tell them how much you love them, but do you know what's happening inside of your, your brain and in your body? Probably not, and if you do, I'm impressed. Good for you. For those of you who don't, there's the pet effect to explain it all. So I'm sure you're asking, what is the pet effect? And how do animals benefit people in such a way that is healthy? The pet effect is a group of scientific research that shows how the animal companions, mainly focused around cats and dogs, um, positively influence areas like mental health, bodily processes, happiness, and the quality of life. Alan Beck at the Purdue University and Aaron Katcher from the University of Pennsylvania organized a study where they measured bodily processes as someone pet a dog. They found that not only blood pressure went down, but heart rate slowed, breathing became consistent, and muscles relaxed. This study was a clear indication of the benefits of pets. Uh, before we jump into it, I'd like to introduce uh, my own family. So this is Mustache, and he has lots of clothes, including the one pictured above, um, and he loves to nap in the sun. Um, next we have Reddy, and he's the sweetest dog you'll ever meet and he also loves stealing food from the dinner table. And lastly, we have um, the lovely Bella, and she enjoys eating and dreaming about food. She's also very fat and fluffy, um, and she's the queen bee of the house. So moving on, I'd like to direct the focus to uh, the brain and to hormones that are released in the brain. So we all have hormones that are released into our bodies by situations or responses to things, and we all have four happiness hormones. They include endorphins, serotonin, dopamine, and oxytocin. In a study by the British Psychological Society, re researchers found that dogs especially stimulate therapeutic or psychological health and lower the stress hormone cortisol. In a 2017 article by Marilyn Gemino, it has been found that just being in the presence of an animal has been shown to lower um, low, uh, lower um, stress levels. So in this next slide, we have um, a brief description of each hormone, and then we start off with endorphins, which reduces pain signals, and uh, serotonin, which boosts mood and makes us more agreeable. Cats. So. In a study by Cornwall College, uh, student Philippa Dennis studied the benefit of human-cat relationships and found that people who became attached to their cats underwent, underwent great calming effects from the created bond. Um, cats also fulfill the need for uh, touch, especially for individuals whose illness prevents them from creating um, those bonds. So stress is typically represented through accelerated heart rate and high blood pressure. And in one study by the University of New York, researchers had 240 married couples uh, perform two tasks, which were doing difficult mouth problems and sticking their hands in ice water for two minutes. And I don't know who would want to do that. That's not enjoyable. So some were alone and some had company, either a spouse, a friend, or a pet. And people had higher blood pressure and heart rates when a spouse or friend was in the room, but in the presence of a pet, they actually had a lower blood pressure. So here, um, it's not shown, but this was actually an experiment where 67 Yale medical students uh, were divided into three groups, and each participant uh, completed a psychological questionnaire um, which measured their current level of anxiety. And here, the graph shows the results after uh, no treatment, uh, pictures of a dog and real dog. And you can obviously see there's a very large decrease uh, in uh, people who saw a real dog. So 
Besides helping out with mental illnesses, uh, pets can also make a person's life better just every day and increase overall quality of life. And actually, therapy is a great way for animals to shine with their healing talents. And in a few short moments, we will be exploring stories of individuals who have uh, been affected by the power of pets, starting off with horses. Uh, so horses are very calming and gentle creatures, and as a former equestrian, um, I've experienced what they're really like, and they're just amazing animals. And equine therapy is with no doubt greatly beneficial to oneself in many areas. So Brianna Bornhorst, the executive director of a therapeutic riding program in Clifton, Virginia, uh, explains how horses help the disabled emotionally and physically, and she says that some of our riders might benefit from the connection and relationship building with the horse and their environment. Um, one particular uh, therapeutic riding uh, student, Ryan, his mother says that riding has helped his following directions and some really core life skills about getting dressed in balance. According to a study by researchers from the University of Missouri, the social skills of children with autism, particularly in the area of assertion, increased over time. And when there was a companion animal present, uh, well, per problem behaviors decreased. So now um, we move on to dog therapy, which is probably one of the most common kinds of therapy uh, there is. And besides dogs, there's actually um, therapy birds, reptiles, small mammals, and even aquatic animals, if you can believe that. Today, we're gonna focus on, this, uh, we're gonna focus on the story of two young friends, um, Zena, who was an abused and abandoned puppy, and uh, this is Johnny Hickey. Um, he is a very quiet boy with autism. And Johnny's mother, Linda, brought him to a fundraiser to meet Zena after seeing um, the dog on a Facebook post. And upon meeting the dog, um, she says that Johnny, usually shy and introverted, came out of his shell. And from that very first day, the dog was sitting in his lap in the car seat, giving him all these kisses. And she also says that he was the happiest child that she had ever seen. So whether you're thinking about volunteering at a local animal shelter or adding a new member to your family, uh, don't forget the many positives of pets. They help us in so many ways to enjoy life and to guide us through life. And remember that people can find something to connect to in a pet that they can't find in anything else. And that's my key to the world. Thank you, Ava. And so this period, um, we only have two presenters this period, and what we're going to do is pretty much what we've done with the other periods is to have a quick Q&A with the two presenters, and then what we will do is bring up all of our presenters for the entire day and have a quick Q&A with them. So that's our goal. Okay. <laughs> Woo! All right. Our first presenter for this period seven Assembly is... Rebecca Benoit. Rebecca is a senior. You can clap for Rebecca, absolutely. Woo! Very good. Okay, Rebecca is a senior here at DHS. She is involved in indoor percussion, dance team, marching band, the school newspaper, National Honor Society, and Rebecca is very, very adept at art, as you will see in a couple of minutes. Uh, Rebecca chose to participate in TED because it seemed like a really unique and interesting opportunity, and she knew that she would regret it if she didn't do it this year, which is, of course, her senior year. She chose her topic because she herself is an artist and has a goal to be an art major in the future at Mass Art. Uh, she wanted to take a look at some problems that are facing professionals in the art community, and more specifically, Rebecca will examine commercialization of freelance artwork and could potentially go and, and what could potentially go wrong when you commercialize art. 
Please welcome Rebecca as she presents Sellout, the commercialization of art. Art, one of the many forms of self-expression and creativity in this world. It's also everywhere, from architecture to clothing to different products. Artists look around and they see inspiration. Many other people look around and they see a price tag. It's the commercialization of art and it's not as good as it seems. Let me start with the basics. What exactly is commercialization? Well, in its simplest form, commercialization is the selling and marketing of a product for financial gain. A sellout, on the other hand, is someone who sacrifices all of their own creativity and passion just to make a profit. There's a fine line between the two terms, because, and it's often debated as to where that line is, since artists need to eat too, you know? But a common thought between a commercialized artist and a sellout is basically just what will sell. So, it's not always all a bad thing. Commercialization of art actually allows for a marketing platform for freelance artists and also exposure to consumers, which means an income. This process is now easier and more effective than ever with the use of social media platforms such as Instagram. On Instagram and other like social media platforms, artists are able to reach out to a larger audience and promote their shops and products. They can build their brand and their aesthetic, and they can even show behind the scenes look at their process. Now, of course, not all social media can be great for artists. Take Pinterest, for example. Artists may not get the proper credit for their work if it's copied or linked incorrectly. Pinterest is now offering so many different ways to tag work to try to minimize this problem. So, going back to those people who see art and therefore money. They don't see the intricate process behind each piece, and frankly, most of the time, they don't care. They see a marketing ploy, and that's pretty much it. These images above include work done by artists Connor Harrington, Keith Haring, and Banksy. Now, what do they all have in common? They all have something to do with commercialized art. Connor Harrington is a famous street artist who's trying to link the world between real art versus street art while also making thousands on his pieces. Herring's work is seen absolutely everywhere and he's one of the most commercialized artists. And Banksy is an anonymous street artist whose controversial, bold pieces are eaten up by the media and hundreds of thousands of people. Now, all of these artists either make or made art and they truly enjoyed it. There was still passion and meaning behind their work. Now, there's a difference between wanting to be a successful artist who creates to create and becoming a sellout who's just in it for the money. A prime example of this is artist Jeff Koons, who is questionably an artist. He's actually a former investment banker who used his skills to market himself as an artist. The catch is, he only has concept ideas. He has a team of people who mass produces his pieces and all of the materials. He doesn't even know how to make his own pieces, yet he's slapping his name on them and making millions off of these. These pieces, which are, by the way, just giant blown up objects of things that already exist that are just made out of synthetic materials. The piece on the right there, which is a giant sculpture of Plato, is estimated to sell at $20 million. The piece on the left, which is, well, a version of the piece on the left, since there are multiple, sold at a whopping $58 million, making it the world's most expensive piece sold by an artist that is currently alive today. Now, critics have called his work tacky, yet why are they selling? He used the marketing ploy of being able to touch on human connection to familiar objects of childhood, and also people supposedly find these to be cute. Now, on a different level of commercialization of art, is being appropriated by companies for their own use while completely disregarding the original intent of the piece. They see dollar signs and aesthetics, and that's pretty much it. Examples include Salvador Dali's The Persistence of Time in a Lipton Tea ad, Hokusai's famous painting The Great Wave off Kanagawa in a Levi Jeans ad, and Andy Warhol's famous pop art style in his banana painting with, for some reason, Orbit Gum. And, of course, I can't forget Starry Night on literally everything. No, I'm serious, literally everything. I mean, can you really blame these companies, though? Starry Night is a beautiful painting that's beloved by many, many people, and companies use that to their advantage in their marketing because people will buy it. On the other hand, it actually ends up diluting the impact of the original piece since it's so oversaturated in the market. 
Another example of this is seen with the famous painting The Scream by Edvard Munch. So it, it too is highly commercialized. The painting is actually so sought after that it recently sold for $119.9 million, making it the world's most expensive piece to be sold at an auction. Now, part of the reason why the price is so high is because it's so commercialized. Basically, with famous paintings, the more, the more commercialized they are, the more expensive they're going to be. Now, the question still stands, much like that with Starry Night. Is this now considered to be a branch of a sellout? Is the fact that this piece is so sought after make it just a mere commodity, or does the artist's original intent still stand? Now, art such as Starry Night and The Scream are also being commercialized through exposure in movies, TV shows, and even music videos, such as Beyonce and Jay-Z's viral music video that was filmed in the Louvre, and it features famous artwork such as the Mona Lisa. Now, as I mentioned before, Banksy is an anonymous artist who makes controversial street art that often has a meaning or a message behind it. This piece here was created to protest the commercialization of art. The main idea behind it is that he would create this piece and then he would sell it, and the moment it was sold, it would be shredded to show the loss of purpose. Now, on the opposite side of commercialization of art is the fact that artist's works is being stolen for commercial use, such as what happened with artist Eliana Esquivel pictured above. Some of her work was stolen, and then that person took her pieces, put it onto their own work, and then sold that for profit. Esquivel is now outspoken about artists' rights and copyright laws on her social media platforms, and rightfully so. See, this isn't just one case. This happens to artists all of the time, everywhere. People are stealing their artwork for profit with their own agendas, and they're not even asking anyone about it. Now, the current copyright law for modern artists is that their work is protected by copyright law from the moment that it's tangibly made. So technically, stealing someone's art for profit is incredibly illegal. However, a lot of the times, artists don't have the financial means to get a lawyer to go after these people. Or, since they're freelance artists, they might not want to risk ruining their reputation through the social forum. Now, a big part of commercialization of art is consumer culture. The consumer decides what they want to see. Right now, for example, minimalistic art is in, since it's aesthetically pleasing and it's simple yet also intricate. Look around at popular clothing and decor shops, and I guarantee you'll find some sort of minimalistic art, whether that's on a t-shirt or a pillow. Just the other day, I was in Pakistan with my friend, and I came across this shirt, which has the same wave painting that I previously mentioned on it, just in a minimalistic fashion. So, what happens if an artist's style doesn't fit directly into consumer culture? Take a fine artist, for example, someone who focuses on realism. Do they now change their style to fit what the consumers want to see? Or does that automatically make them a sellout and feed negatively into commercialization? Especially with the current stigma around social media, artists may feel pressured to adapt and change their work in order to get more notice and more likes from people. So that being said, artists do change their style, but that's more on a basis of what's culturally relevant, how they can get best their, how could they can get their ideas across best, and just what really speaks to them at the moment. It's more of a, a topic of whether or not they're doing it for the right reasons. Now, a part of keeping artists from becoming sellouts and keeping the passion in the arts is through the consumer. Always credit artists when using their content, support their freelance shops and sites, and report any counterfeit art and uh, stolen work that you might see. A really, really easy way to promote positive commercialization of art is through shops like Etsy. Etsy is an online shop where anyone can sell their work to anyone. Artists are able to sell their pieces on their own terms in a market that's designed specifically for this. Furthermore, Etsy is a place for consumers to find really unique gifts and pieces. It really is an underused site that's valuable to the artist movement. So, at the end of the day, support local artists, promote positive commercialization of art, and just keep being creative. And that's my key to the world. Thank you. Thank you, Rebecca. That was very informative. And our last presenter of the day, Jocelyn Jerome. 